Clash of Kings, Chapter 13 John White Tree, the village was named on Sam's old maps. John did not think it much of a village. Four tumble-down one-room houses of unmortared stone surrounded an empty sheepfold in a well. The houses were roofed with sod, the windows shuttered with ragged pieces of hide, and above them loomed the pale limbs and dark red leaves of a monstrous great weirwood. It was the biggest tree John Snow had ever seen, the trunk near eight feet wide, the branches spreading so far that the entire village was shaded beneath their canopy. The size did not disturb him so much as the face. The mouth especially, no simple carved slash, but a jagged hollow large enough to swallow a sheep. Those are not sheep bones, though, nor is that a sheep's skull in the ashes. An old tree. Mormont sat his horse, frowning. Old, his raven agreed from his shoulder. Old, old, old. And powerful. John could feel the power. Thorin Smallwood dismounted beside the trunk, dark in his plate and mail. Look at that face. Small wonder men feared them when they first came to Westeros. I'd like to take an axe to the bloody thing myself. John said, My lord father believed no man could tell a lie in front of a heart tree. The old gods know when men are lying. My father believed the same, said the old bear. Let me have a look at that skull. John dismounted. Slung across his back in a black leather shoulder sheath was Longclaw, the hand and a half bastard blade the old bear had given him for saving his life. A bastard sword for a bastard, the men joked. The hilt had been fashioned new for him, adorned with a wolf's head pommel and pale stone, but the blade itself was Valyrian steel, old and light and deadly sharp. He knelt and reached a gloved hand down into the maw. The inside of the hollow was red with dried sap and blackened by fire. Beneath the skull he saw another, smaller, the jaw broken off. It was half buried in ash and bits of bone. When he brought the skull to Mormont, the old bear lifted it in both hands and stared into the empty sockets. The wildlings burn their dead. We've always known that. Now I wished I'd asked them why when there were still a few around to ask. Jon Snow remembered the white rising, its eyes shining blue in the pale, dead face. He knew why. He was certain. Would that bones could talk, the old bear grumbled. This fellow can tell us much. How he died, who burned him, and why. Where the wildlings have gone, he sighed. The children of the forest could speak to the dead, it said. But I can't. He tossed the skull back into the mouth of the tree where it landed with a puff of fine ash. Go through all these houses. Giant, get to the top of this tree. Have a look. I'll have the hounds brought up too. Perchance this time the trail will be fresher. His tone did not suggest that he held out much hope of the last. Two men went through each house to make certain nothing was missed. John was paired with Dower Edison Tollett, a squire gray of hair and thin as a pike, whom the other brothers called Dolorous Ed. Bad enough when the dead come walking, he said to John as they crossed the village. Now the old bear wants them talking as well. No good will come of that, I'll warrant. Who's to say the bones wouldn't lie? Why should death make a man truthful, or even clever? The dead are likely dull fellows full of tedious complaints. The ground's too cold. My gravestone should be larger. Why does he get more worms than I do? John had to stoop to pass through the low door. Within he found a packed dirt floor. There were no furnishings, no sign that people had lived here but for some ashes beneath the smoke hole in the roof. What a dismal place to live, he said. I was born in a house much like this, declared Dolores Ed. Those were my enchanted years. Later I fell on hard times. A nest of dry straw bedding filled one corner of the room. Ed looked at it with longing. I'd give all the gold in Castelly Rock to sleep in a bed again. You call that a bed? If it's softer than the ground and has a roof over it, I call it a bed. Dolores Ed sniffed the air. We smelled dung. The smell was very faint. Old dung, said John. The house felt as though it had been empty for some time. Kneeling, he searched through the straw with his hands to see if anything had been concealed beneath, then made a round of the walls. It did not take very long. There's nothing here. Nothing was what he had expected. White Tree was the fourth village they had passed, and it had been the same in all of them. The people were gone, vanished with their scant possessions and whatever animals they may have had. None of the villages showed any signs of having been attacked. They were simply... empty. What do you think happened to them all? John asked. 
Something worse than we can imagine, suggested Dolores Head. Well, I might be able to imagine it, but I'd sooner not. Bad enough to know you're gonna come to some awful land without thinking about it aforetime. Two of the hounds were sniffing around the door as they reemerged. Other dogs ranged through the village. Chat was cursing them loudly, his voice thick with the anger he never seemed to put aside. The light filtering through the red leaves of the weirwood made the boils on his face look even more inflamed than usual. When he saw John, his eyes narrowed. There was no love lost between them. The other houses had yielded no wisdom. Gone, cried Mormon's raven, flapping up into the weirwood to perch above them. Gone, gone, gone. There were wildlings at White Tree only a year ago. Thorin Smallwood looked more allured than Mormont did, clad in Sir Jeremy Riker's gleaming black mail and embossed breastplate. His heavy cloak was richly trimmed with sable and clasped with the crossed hammers of the Riker's rotten silver. Sir Jeremy's cloak once, but the white had claimed Sir Jeremy, and the Night's Watch wasted nothing. A year ago, Robert was king, and the realm was at peace, declared Jarman Buckwell, the square, stolid man who commanded the scouts. Much can change in a year's time. One thing hasn't changed, Sir Malader Locke insisted. Fewer wildlings means fewer worries. I won't mourn whatever's become of them. Raiders and murderers, the lot of them. John heard a rustling from the red leaves above. Two branches parted, and he glimpsed a little man moving from limb to limb as easily as a squirrel. Bedwick stood no more than five feet tall, but the gray streaks in his hair showed his age. The other rangers called him Giant. He sat in the fork of a tree over their heads and said, there's water to the north. Lake might be. A few flint hills rising to the west, not very high. Nothing else to see, my lords. We might camp here tonight, Smallwood suggested. The old bear glanced up, searching for a glimpse of sky through the pale limbs and red leaves of the weirwood. No, he declared. Giant, how much daylight remains to us? Three hours, my lord. We'll press on north, Mormont decided. If we can reach this lake, we can make camp by the shore, perchance catch a few fish. John, fetch me paper. It's past time I wrote Maester Eamon. John found parchment, quill, and ink in his saddlebag and brought them to the Lord Commander. At White Tree, Mormont scrawled, the fourth village, all empty. The wildlings are gone. Find Tarly and see that he gets this on its way, he said as he handed John the message. When he whistled, his raven came flapping down to land on his horse's head. Corn, the raven suggested, bobbing. The horse wickered. John mounted his garron, wheeled him about, and trotted off. Beyond the shade of the great weirwood, the men of the Night's Watch stood beneath lesser trees, tending their horses, chewing strips of salt beef, pissing, scratching, and talking. When the command was given to move out again, the talk died, and they climbed back into their saddles. Jarman Buckwell's scouts rode out first, with the vanguard under Thorn Smallwood heading the column proper. Then came the old bear with the main force, Sir Malader Locke with the baggage train and pack horses, and finally Sir Otten Withers and the rear guard. Two hundred men, all told, with half again as many mounts. By day, they followed game trails and stream beds, the rangers' roads that led them ever deeper into the wilderness of leaf and root. At night, they camped beneath a starry sky and gazed up at the comet. The Black Brothers had left Castle Black in good spirits, joking and trading tales, but of late the brooding silence of the woods seemed to have sombered them all. Jests had grown fewer and tempers shorter. No one would admit to being afraid. They were men of the Night's Watch, after all. But John could feel the unease. Four empty villages, no wildlings anywhere, even the game seemingly fled. The haunted forest had never seemed more haunted, even veteran rangers agreed. As he rode, John peeled off his glove to air his burned fingers. Ugly things. He remembered suddenly how he used to muss Arya's hair, his little stick of a sister. He wondered how she was faring. It made him a little sad to think that he might never moss her hair again. He began to flex his hand, opening and closing the fingers. If he let his sword hand stiffen and grow clumsy, it might well be the end of him, he knew. A man needed his sword beyond the wall. John found Samuel Tarley with the other stewards, watering his horses. He had three to tend, his own mount and two pack horses, each bearing a large wire and wicker cage full of ravens. The birds flapped their wings at John's approach and screamed at him through the bars. A few shrieks sounded suspiciously like words. "'Have you been teaching them to talk?' he asked Sam. "'A few words. Three of them can say snow.' "'One bird croaking my name was bad enough,' said John. "'And snow is nothing a black brother wants to hear about.' 
Snow often meant death in the north. There anything in White Tree? Bones, ashes, and empty houses. John handed Sam the roll of parchment. The old bear wants word sent back to Eamon. Sam took a bird from one of the cages, stroked its feathers, attached the message, and said, Fly home now, brave one. Home. The raven quarked something unintelligible back at him, and Sam tossed it into the air. Flapping, it beat its way skyward through the trees. I wish he could carry me with him. Still? Well, said Sam, yes, but not as frightened as I was, truly. The first night, every time I heard someone getting up to make water, I thought it was wildlings creeping in to slit my throat. I was afraid that if I closed my eyes, I might never open them again, only... Well, dawn came after all. He managed a wan smile. I may be craven, but not stupid. I'm sore and my back aches from riding and from sleeping on the ground, but I'm hardly scared at all. Look. He held out a hand for John to see how steady it was. I've been working on my maps. The world is strange, John thought. Two hundred brave men had left the wall, and the only one who was not growing more fearful was Sam, the self-confessed coward. We'll make a ranger of you yet, he joked. Next thing you'll want to be an outrider like Gren. Shall I speak to the old bear? Don't you dare. Sam pulled up the hood of his enormous black cloak and clambered awkwardly back onto his horse. It was a plow horse, big and slow and clumsy, but better able to bear his weight than the little garrons the rangers rode. I'd hoped we might stay the night in the village, he said wistfully. It would be nice to sleep under a roof again. Too few roofs for all of us. John mounted again, gave Sam a parting smile, and rode off. The column was well underway, so we swung wide around the village to avoid the worst of the congestion. He had seen enough of White Tree. Ghost emerged from the undergrowth so suddenly that the garron shied and reared. The white wolf hunted well away from the line of march, but he was not having much better fortune than the foragers Smallwood sent out after game. The woods were as empty as the villages, Diwan had told them one night around the fire. We're a large party, John had said. The game's probably been frightened away by all the noise we make in the march. Frightened away by something, no doubt, Diwan said. Once the horse had settled, Ghost loped along easily beside him. John caught up to Mormont as he was wending his way around a hawthorn thicket. The bird away? the old bear asked. Yes, my lord. Sam is teaching them to talk. The old bear snorted. He'll regret that. Damn things make a lot of noise, but they never say a thing worth hearing. They rode in silence until John said, If my uncle found all these villages empty as well, he would have made it his purpose to learn why, Lord Mormont finished for him. And it may well be someone or something did not want that known. Well, we'll be three hundred when Corrin joins us. Whatever enemy waits out here will not find us so easy to deal with. We will find them, John. I promise you. Or they will find us, thought John.